Can you hear me? I'm sorry. It's the last thing that I turn on because I don't like the um, sound that it makes. I'm going to wait to see if you can hear me now. <laughs> yes, I am. I am silly. I'm a rookie at this. Can you hear me? Tell me you can hear me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yay, you can hear me now. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> you you know, it's just, you just gotta forgive me. I'm a sewer, not a video maker. <laughs> all right, well, let me just tell you a little about what I'm doing since I just talked to you a whole lot and um, now you have no idea what I was talking about. So. I am making the Colette Hawthorne dress. Um, let me show you where to put the pattern. Here we go. Okay, so let me start over again. Uh, so the Colette Hawthorne dress is a dress that I've been really wanting to make. It's uh, kind of that style where it's uh, like a day dress, and um, I've really wanted a dress like that for a while. And um, the one thing I really like about this is the smooth waist. There's not gathers. And can you see? I'm going to make this one with the short sleeves. And it does have, I know it's a little blurry when I get close, because I turn on, I turn off the autofocus. Otherwise, it'll do a lot of little, um, little, ugh, it's icky. So anyway, I have um, this pattern I've had that's for a while, and I just finally cut it out and I don't see people sew this pattern very often so I'm kind of curious why it's probably just because uh, people are sewing things that are that have newly come out and I am really excited about it I think that the the pat the picture there doesn't really flatter the the dress style very much and I'm hoping that when we sew it up we're going to see that it's really great I have added pockets to this <laughs> forgive me thanks <laughs> um I've added pockets to this. Um, coincidentally, uh, Kirby last time when we streamed was asking about waist pockets, and I I was mistakenly thinking of something completely different. Um, and now, when she sent me a picture, I know exactly what she means. She means um, what I would probably call a jean pocket. So the pocket has a scoop in the front, and you can put your hand right there, so it's a little easier to find your pocket, which is nice with pants pockets like that. Uh, you don't really see those on dresses very often because they're a little more of a uh, more of a casual look sometimes. Um, I opted for that style of pocket on this dress, uh, not a side seam pocket, because um, I I do like the idea of being able to find my pockets really easily. The other benefit to that style of pocket is that it always is in the front of your dress. And I don't know if you guys have ever sewn side seam pockets and they kind of like push to the back and you're kind of looking for them and you're like, why, why am I sitting on my car keys? Um, that's why, because they're not attached at the waist seam and I really like it when pockets are like that. It takes more fabric and a little bit more planning when I'm sewing the dress together. But if you prep the dress or the skirt properly, it's just a, it's a breeze. So I did... I did cut the, uh, I did create a pocket and cut it out that way so we can do that together. I can show you the pattern um, modifications that I made. Um, when I cut out an outfit or anything I'm cutting out, I stack it up before I bring it to my machine in a way that makes sense to me. I've left some of my pattern pieces here so that if you want to see any of them as I'm going, you can. Um, but what I usually do is I always put the front on top of the back. So I have my front bodice on top of my back bodice, my front skirt on top of my back skirt. I don't typically get my bodices confused, but I definitely get my skirts confused um, quite often. And there's nothing worse than removing a skirt from a waist seam <laughs> when it's already sewn on. Um, I don't like to seam rip just as much as you don't. So. Um, the sleeve is obviously pretty easy as well, and then I also, well, these are my pockets right there. I'm going to set those aside over there. Here's my sleeve. And then all my little fussy things like my collar and my facings. I rarely use interfacing. You're going to find that I kind of break that rule, but it's, um, 
I'm going to use it on this because this fabric is kind of thin and wrinkly, like um, like it's been in the dryer wrinkly, and it'll be a little fussy, and I don't want it to look harder than it needs to while I'm sewing live, you know? So there's that. <laughs> and um, the other thing I plan on doing is machine sewing my buttons on. <laughs> So I know that breaks the couture sewing rules, and um, if my sewing teacher saw me do that, she would definitely be disappointed in me. But I hate hand sewing. You're going to learn this about me. I will do anything in my power not to have to hand sew something. Like, I will go to great lengths. It's, it's pathetic sometimes. So I'm trying to get better about, you know, stepping it up and hand sewing something when I need to. I hand sew the buttons on all my hand knit sweaters, I promise. I don't make that mistake, especially since I like to add um, like what I call a shank to the back of the button. If it's a button with holes um, and there's not a natural shank, which is like the post of the button, um, I add one made out of thread, and I can show you how I do that someday. Uh, I learned that in a, working in a tailoring shop, one of the worst <laughs> experiences I've ever had was working at that tailoring shop except that I learned so many amazing things there and really she did alterations not tailoring so um, I will probably <laughs> machine sew these buttons on here because there's so gosh darn many of them going down to the bottom of the dress um, and you know I don't mind doing buttonholes I just don't really like sewing buttons so uh, I put the shank on a four button a four hole button or a two hole button mainly so that there's space for the garment to be, go between the button and the it, the garment itself so that way you're not stretching the buttons not pulling on the part it's attached to which makes sometimes buttons rip off completely which is really hard to repair and on my hand knits I obviously don't want that to happen because I've spent so much time hand knitting that thing I'm not going to stress it out with a machine sewn button. <laughs> Plus I feel like my hand would get slapped for that for sure. So anyway. Alright, I'm just trying to make sure I can see your guys' comments and stuff. <laughs> yes, exactly, Kirby. I you know, and sometimes I write little post-it notes so that I can keep track of what I'm sewing, especially if it's a it's just a garment that's not straightforward like this. This is a very classic pattern something you would learn how to draft in design school first quarter. The basic bodice, the skirt, it's very feminine. Um, that is exactly what they teach you how to draft your first quarter. It's a very basic pattern. Um, I typically don't even use the, the sewing instructions on a, a bot pattern because I think just because there's certain logic that I've learned in putting together some of these basic silhouettes that you know, you always do your shoulder seams, you always do your, uh, any extra treatments like um, assemble your facing, put on your pockets, things like that, and then you start assembling the garment. I will sometimes browse the instructions to see if there's any, th any curveballs or um, something that the pattern designer decided to do uh, differently than how I would have. Nothing wrong with that. I, I just like to... Um, there's just different ways to draft a pattern. So on something like this, this is a very simple, straightforward silhouette. And um, I am going to start sewing a little bit. And I also cut out some uh, samples of bodices with uh, facings so that we can do the some understitch and top stitch differences. Sorry, I thread my machine, and I have to do it from the back foot to the front. You can't see the thread arm there, but it's really tricky. There we go. This is the um, this is the joke in my shop. Like when Ryan worked here, our joke was always, <laughs> "Do we have to change the thread <laughs> because we don't really want to?" It's kind of funny. We're really lazy, aren't we? We are just lazy. So I just got my new machine this week, and I am really happy with it so far. I used to have a Juki 5500 Industrial, 
I had it for a really long time. I got it for the whopping price of $300 uh, from my friend. And um, it was time. My motor blew up finally in that machine. It was probably 40 years old. I did not have it that long, obviously. But um, it had seen a really good life. I still have it here. And I was still sewing on it uh, up until the day he brought me my new machine. And um, I'm going to post a video on sewing on the, the difference between a machine with the electronics and without the electronics because the there is a really big difference with that. And anyone looking to buy a, a home sewing machine, or I mean an industrial sewing machine, would probably want to see the difference of that. Sorry, I was in the middle of doing all this and I got distracted. So I was trying to get set up. So I need to put, I'm putting in a size 14 needle because usually I use a size 18 needle. So tell me, what are you guys sewing these days? And what do you, what's your ambitious project that you want to take on or the thing you want to per, per, uh, perfect? I want to know those things. I don't usually shake like this. It's because I'm holding the thread so hard. <laughs> I did wind a bobbin. A little helpful uh, trick when I forget to wind a bobbin on my industrial machine, I can wind one on my home machine. It's really easy. It's the because the um, inside here that's the same. I don't ever have a home sewing machine set up in my shop though until recently, so it's kind of nice. I, I really miss winding bobbins on the <laughs> machine. It's really fast and really quiet. Um, but, you know, typically, like right now, my machine is winding a bobbin as I sew. That's how industrials are set up. You put the bobbin on the side of the machine and you engage it, and it's always winding a bobbin as you're using up the last one. It takes a lot less time to wind a bobbin, but hey. Um, at least it's happening while you're doing it. And then, if, But if you forget to do it, then you have to do it with the machine running and it, it's a little it makes me a little nervous to do that because I don't want the, cause the needles going up and down you can't disengage the needle in an industrial so so anyway I am posting a video on sewing the different sewing with the difference between an industrial with electronics and without you'll probably hear me talk about this a lot because I think when people sew with home machines they're kind of curious like why I choose to sew on a industrial machine and um, I just really like it. Once I started sewing on an industrial machine, I haven't gone back. So that is basically it. <laughs> All right, what is this? Collar back, collar front. What do you guys think of the collar? It looks a little, a little goofy, but I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to go for the pattern as is. I tend to make a lot of modifications to my um, <laughs> to my patterns, and I'm going to try and not do a whole lot of that right now. Play a hooky. I'm a complete amateur. I've only done mending and sewn two skirts. Hey, uh, that's great. Mending is, that's like the stuff I never get to. I would much rather sew a garment from start to finish than fix something. And I, uh, I call that my like 15 minute pile <laughs> because I feel like when you have these things to mend, like put a button on something or, um, Maybe it's to, uh, let me see here. Maybe it's to um, fix the hem on something. That pile will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I sit there dreading it. And then when I get to it, it takes me like 15 minutes to do all of it. And I don't know why I procrastinated for so long. Pretty bad. All right. So I'm going to sew my facing. And so one mistake I see people do when they're doing their seam allowance is they line up the, uh, well, this is pretty obvious where you want to do it, but you want to line the seam line, not the, um, not tip to tip. And I am going to back tack. I have a back tack right here where my finger is. That's why you'll see me do that. And then I have an automatic thread snip. So that's the electronics on my machine. It will do an automatic back tack or a, and also it will do the thread snip and I'm really addicted to that. It makes things a lot faster. 
think these are half inch seams. So I'm getting my facings ready. I'm going to set them aside. These are my skirt facings. And then I'm going to sew my collar together. Because um, I get all these pieces ready to go. So that way when I put my, my dress together, it goes really fast. I'm having trouble seeing the wrong side and the right side of this fabric. My collar. All right. So I put the interfacing on the top collar. Um, this is, uh, it's interesting that this pattern doesn't have a top collar and an under collar, but I think that they just don't do patterns like that for home sewists because it's just so many extra pieces, but typically that's, um, you would actually have a, um, you would have a pattern with both top collar and under collar. So I'm going to get to actually under stitch on this soon too. This collar looks more like a Peter Pan collar. All right. Oh, the mistake on the seam allowance. Yeah, let me, you know what, I think I'll be able to show you on the bodice what mistake it is because typically what people will do is they will line up their seam like corner to corner and see this actually works but what you want to do is if your seam allowance is a half inch like right here and this one's at a half inch right of course you want to line this seam line up at the point that they would intersect here so even if this piece right here went like this, like winged out like this, you want to line it up right here at this juncture because once it's sewn and it opens up, you want a smooth transition right here. And that little point is only because maybe this was going to go zoop, like curve over and that little point was going to nestle in along this edge here. I don't have a really good example of what I'm talking about with this pattern here because there's almost a right angle juncture there. But I do see that like people will do it and they're like the seam doesn't match up and it's because they're not lining it up at the juncture of the seam allowance but at the um, cut edge and those are different measurements typically. Does that make sense? Yeah, we could do a whole thing about um, seam allowances. All right. Oh, did I forget my facing? Okay, see, here we go. You guys are going to have to bear with me. I'm getting used to, like, sewing live and talking through it. <laughs> so I forgot my interfacing here, so I'm just going to attach it afterward. This is totally fine. As long as I get right on that original seam line, it's going to be fine. It's not ideal just because I added a whole nother line of stitching, which adds bulk. Um, we're not sewing on something so lightweight that that'll make a difference. I'm just making sure that I got on that, that on there smoothly before I finish the other one. And I can feel it. You can kind of see the ridge there. See, there's no reason to take out those shoulder seams just to put that interfacing on. I don't know if you guys ever do that, but occasionally I do, and I am quite distracted too. All right, so now I'm going to, I'm just going to finger press my, seams open here. That's what they mean by finger press. Basically, instead of ironing it, you could iron too. And this is my top collar. The one with the inner facing and the more stabilizer is my top collar. All right. Um, if I go too fast or too slow, just let me know. Okay. I, I got my, my cutting off really bad right there. I didn't even realize it. So I'm going to sew the quarter inch seam. When I go along, can you see my needle? Is that better? 
You, I can move the cameras, you guys. Just tell me. And when I get to the corner, I'm actually going to leave my needle down. My machine does that automatically. Leaves the needle down and then turn. And I'm going to press my seams open as I get to them. On a collar, because we didn't overlock the seam edge, we have the option to keep the seam open. If we had overlocked it or surged it, like with a serger, and we had done it together, we would have had to push them one way or the other. And um, then if I had done that, I would have pushed one one direction and one the other direction to reduce the bulk at the seam right here. Uh, the fabric is, it's art gallery. That's all I remember. I'm going to start trying to keep track of that. I'm really terrible with stuff like that, sorry. I don't even know some of the fabrics in our line for chicken boots sometimes, and people are like, oh, I'm so glad to see you have uh, so-and-so. I'm like, I just pick what I like. Um, it's really rare I pick a fabric for our, for our chicken boot stuff that I'm like, oh, people are going to love this because this is a popular designer. Because sometimes I don't like what's, what they're making. Um, you know, some seasons I like, sometimes I don't. I pick what I think my customers will like, just in general, and what I like as well. All right, so I'm just going around. Totally fine to do this with, with pins. If you sew with pins, I'm just going to tell you, like, the way to do it is to always pin perpendicular to your seam so that when you are going along you don't have to stop and take the pin out um, you can just sew right over it with your machine I can show you watch I'll just sew right over this just like that and then you know once you're done sewing then you can take all your pins out and the reason I say that you can take them out as you go but at least you don't have to um, let go of your work just in case it is a bit tricky of whatever you're making alright so I'm going to trim my corners like that and that's so when I turn this right side out I've reduced the bulk right here because remember when this is turned right side out all of this has to go in here right so we're making room for it to do that and I think sometimes it's hard to think inside out because that's what you're doing when you're sewing is sewing inside out basically and um, you want to reduce that bulk just like that I'm not going to cut my corners there yet. All right, and the other thing I'm going to do is clip the curve, and I just cut into this right up to the seam. So here's my seam right there. I'm going to cut to right there like that, just like, like this. And I'm just going to snip in there like this. And it's the same principle, like when we're turning it, right side out all of this edge is going to need some space you see those little things they're like little flaps they, they they overlap each other and if they aren't doing that what happens oh I'm, I'm covering up the edge sorry about that I moved the camera so my table okay how's that that's a little better huh okay so I'm trim I'm clipping my seam right now like this right up to that seam not through it not too close but like right here about like a fat sixteenth of an inch away and um, the reason we're doing that is because when we turn it right side out like this those are going to overlap with each other because they need the space to move now you don't want to do these so infrequently that you end and so close to the edge that you'd get like a jagged smooth curve and not a smooth curve because you want this to be a nice smooth curve, right? So that's why we don't go all the way up to the seam. We go mostly up the way. Also, you don't want to worry about the integrity of the fabric right there so close to the seam. On something like a collar, it's not a stress point, right? Once it's sewn and hanging from the, the neckline, um, it's done. It's done its job. It's not a side seam. It's not a um, armhole or anything getting a lot of wear. So can you see that really well? I feel like 
I can't tell if it's focused very well from because of where I have to look at to see. Yeah, I like this fabric, Kirby. It's a really big print, and I think what I had it picked out for um, was something different, but I can't remember what that was. <laughs> All right, I'm also going to trim this a little bit because um, I can see it's a little, a little uneven. I just want it to look nice. I was trying to keep my work area clean. All right, so now I'm going to turn this right side out, and I'm actually going to stick my thumb right there in that corner like this and poke it. I'm going to do my other corner as well. And remember, the side with my interfacing is the top collar, the right side, the part that everyone's going to see when I'm wearing my dress. All right. This I'll probably have to iron. But I'm going to edge stitch it first. I'm going to under stitch it first. And so under stitching, I know I'm going to do a little demo on that today. Under stitching keeps your fabric and your seam. It's uh, it to the underside of the garment. So if I were to edge stitch this, you would see the stitching and uh, it would be very flat. Under stitching is going to hold this to the underside of the collar so that when I'm wearing it, you know, when I'm wearing it, it doesn't do this, right? You, we've all seen that collar, right, where the underside creeps to the top. You don't, it doesn't look professional, it looks home sewn. A little bit happens like that, it's totally fine, but we're going to try and prevent as much of it as possible. I use it all for just about everything in life. <laughs> I really love it all, and I'm just going to poke out my corner a little bit better there. Do both of them at the same time. The all I use, I actually bought one in the package so you could see it because um, I, I want, I'm going to have to find it. Um, because I want, there's two different awls. I use the Clover tapered awl. Um, it's not as sharp. The other one's like a stiletto. It's just too sharp. It, it just punctures right through things. All right, so, okay. Robin Turner Art Gallery. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you, you know, Robin Turner's not the name. That's your name. Art Gallery is the fabric. Yeah, exactly. I, do you know the, um... Style. I can look at the selvage for you guys. It's really pretty though. I bought it last year at my little local fabric store. All right. Yeah, I know this is really, really bad, you guys. I it, and it's going to cause me a problem later. I know, I know. <laughs> All right. I'm under stitching. Okay. And when I'm under stitching, this is what's happening. Remember, this is my top collar, the one that's going to show to the world. This is my under collar, the one I'm going to stitch onto. So I'm pushing the seam allowance to the under collar, and I'm going to stitch right here, just a little bit far away, kind of like where we clipped to, but on this side. It doesn't have to be the prettiest stitch. It just needs to be um, it's doing its job. Okay, and so I actually returned my corner out because I need to get kind of close to it. I'm just going to get as close as I can. If you've ever wondered this in home sewing patterns, what they mean when they say to do this, and you're like, I can't get close to that thing. Just get as close as you can, pick it up, and then pick it up again as close as you can to that corner. And this is where my motto, let it know who's boss, really comes in. You are the boss of this project and this fabric, right? You're going to tell it what you want. You're not going to start until you get what you want. Okay, so now I've got my needle in there holding everything down. Here's my undercolors. This is the way I look at it. Look at it like this, and then I push this here. The seam allowance is pressed towards this way. This is pressed this way, and I'm going to sew right on top of that. And I'm kind of centering my presser foot edge over the um, actual seam as a guide. This isn't something you can pin without it getting a little prickly, literally. Ooh, my new machine is, I'm really impressed that it's sewing home sew stuff. I'm pretty excited because my other one was calibrated for such heavy duty sewing. This one, I didn't have them calibrated for such heavy sewing. I still need to do some of that, but this has been doing the job, too. It doesn't like vinyl so far. But that stitch, it's a little wiggly. I'm still working on that. I'm going to make my stitch length a little shorter. It's okay. It's 
still getting to know it. So the one of the um, risks when you are sewing your understitch, and we've clipped all this, is that one of these little guys might be rebellious and go to the front like this. Like it'll, it'll like split. If you've cut too close to the, the seam edge, to the stitching, um, that can happen, and it happens to me sometimes. That is actually something I would... Um, pick out a little bit of the seam and then redo it right there because you'll be thankful when you go to press it that you have that nice smooth curve. I like when I get to the dark bits because it covers up my stitching. <laughs> when I get to those peach things I'm like oh look at my wiggly top stitching or uh, under stitching. <laughs> I'm going to get as close to my corner as possible. Now, I'm, I'm just doing really short back tack because it's, like I said, it's not a seam of stress, right? I don't need a really big back tack. Okay, and I'm going to start as close to the edge, just on this little short edge. I may have nicked that one. All right, let's see how I did. Oh, yeah, I did nick it. So we're just going to take that out as fast as possible. That way we don't get any... Um, stitching there, or a little hole there. Okay, pop my corners. Because I popped all those little collar corners out earlier, it kind of will want to do that again, I think. Yeah, so, oh shoot. Um, so you see, like my stitching with this machine is a little long. The stitches are a little long. That's why you're seeing it pull there. I'm going to adjust my tension a little bit tighter. All right, so you see I'm getting this nice curve, and when I go to press it, it's going to want to stay on the underside like this. You see that? Without even me pressing it yet, it's already staying to the underside. Can you see that? So see how it wants to pull the under collar more and so the top collar kind of wraps around the edge there that way more of the top collar shows than the under collar and it's just a classier look now if you don't like under stitching and you don't like the if it doesn't come out the way you like um, and you do like top stitching you can just edge stitch along your collar edge as well it just depends on what fabric you're using and how you want it to look So as you see, like when I turn this corner, I accidentally pulled too far. My stitches are too far apart. I know exactly what's going on there. That is a problem. That's why sometimes your stitch length um, gives you, you don't even realize that's what's giving you the problem. In home sewing, I think the ideal, who I don't want to say a number and then you guys stick to it. Um, <laughs> because it should be a, whatever you like and whatever you want. All right, so there's my collar. In the, in the garment industry, it's 12 stitches per inch. Uh, in home sewing, it's probably 10 stitches per inch. Or, or no, I'm sorry, it's the reverse. It's 12 stitches per inch in home sewing and 10 for the um, garment industry. 10 is a longer, they're further apart. That's why there's fewer in the inch, and that, that's what's happening there. All right, you see that? So I have my collar laying there so pretty. Got my facing. Let's sew our uh, bodice together. And, you know, if you guys get bored of this, just let me know if you want me to move on to the um, little demos I have of understitching, edge stitching. But I figure I'm just going to see what you guys like and see how this goes. And then um, see what you guys respond to and what you want because I'm open to whatever you guys want to sew together and see. All right, so here is my front bodice. And I know it's my front because... It's two pieces. I'm going to show you a trick. I'm marking your darts that someone taught me eons ago. So when you have, that's another reason I kept the paper. It's my front. Yeah. Okay. When you have darts, you don't want to mark, like I only mark uh, my, the legs of my dart with a little snip. So you can see my snip right there. Snip. I, I mark, my, mark my notches, same way. Snip. 
Um, uh, sometimes people leave the little triangle that pokes out. Whatever you want. Um, I use a rotary knife to cut everything out. So I put weights on my pattern paper and my fabric, and then I just rotary knife it really fast. I, I just want to get as much done as possible. It's just kind of how I'm built. So um, when I'm doing my darts, though, I don't know how many times I've gotten to my machine and I forgot to mark this spot. I'm sure you guys have all been there, or some sort of interior marking. Um, I don't mark the buttons and buttonholes because this depends on the size of the button um, that I'm going to be using, so I would not mark that at all because if I don't end up using their markings, I'll have wasted all that time. Um, and uh, we can mark those together later on. I'll show you. Okay, so here's the legs of my my dart. Or, yeah, so I'm going to take these pins out. And this worked really well in college because in college they don't allow you um, pins with a big head on it. They're just steel head pins with the little tiny, like the classic pin. And uh, it works better for that. I And I will note about pins. I When I use them, I buy glass head or something that I can iron. Otherwise, they can melt. These don't. They're not glass, I'm pretty sure. I can't remember. They're the quilter's pins. But they... Um, don't melt either, but I'm typically I'm not ironing a whole lot and doing home sewing. Alright, so I'm doing the size 10, and what I do is I pin like that, take my other one, and I do the same thing. I just go like right where it went in. I don't care about the paper on the other side. I'm going to trust this one like that. And then I fold the paper back, and I hold it, and I just pull it off like that. And now I do this. And there are my darts. And I will tell you, another tip is that I always do it on the wrong side of the fabric. That way I'm not sitting here, like if I folded my fabric the other way and cut it out with the right side out. If I had done that, I would have the pin on this side like that, but I'm not sewing from this side, I'm sewing from the other side. And I would have had to sit there and get another pin and move it, and um, I, that's more more just fussiness. All right, so I'm going to sew my darts. I'm going to hope my machine is calibrated for this kind of sewing because this is when that kind of calibration will show up. So if you've if the pattern was made well and uh, the uh, dart was on the proper grain because it does need, like the, the boss needs to be on the right grain line. This is how you can tell sometimes a good pattern a draft was drafted well and that you cut your fabric out well, you're not going to get any torquing like weird diagonal lines here when you try to match up these two to this. It should just lay nice and flat. You don't need to pin that. And you're going to start at the bottom always and line up the top with the front of your machine like that and do the straightest line. It doesn't look straight from your angle because the camera is right here, like it's right here and my machine's over here, but I'm going in a straight line because I let the machine guide it. And if you're doing a light fabric like this, I just go off the edge. I'm actually not going to thread snip. I'm going to pull out my, uh, my work. I'm going to leave the thread take up up here, this right here at the top. If you leave that at the top every time, you won't accidentally unthread your needle. I don't know if that helps you. And the reason I do this and I don't back tack, um, for a couple of reasons. If um, I don't like the dart placement, it'll be easier to take out. But the main reason is so that you don't have this chunk of thread sitting here right near your boob. Um, so flattering, right? Because uh, you don't want people to look at the top of your dart when you're wearing your outfit. And so then I hand tie it. Okay, <laughs> this is a real talk. When I was first taught that, I was thinking, heck no, I'm going to do that. I was also probably 14 years old when I learned that and um, lazy. Um, and I actually am really lazy. <laughs> and more so lately, I, or not lately, but I have learned over time, like, you know, if you really want good results, why wouldn't you, you know, sew it it's with the best possible, right? Ensure success, right? With the best possible results. So, all right, I'm going to do my other one. Is this kind of information interesting to you guys, or is it totally boring? <laughs> is it too basic? Is it not basic enough? 
I don't see any of you chatting in there, so it's hard for me to tell. And tell me what you guys want to see and what you want to hear. I really am open to whatever. I'm going to post, like, load some, um, really quick little videos, like, on the, the stitch differences and maybe some of the seam allowance, stuff like that. All right. So, um, darts always get pressed towards the front, and, um, that's why this all lines up. It's another good indication, you know, you'll know you want it to go that way, right? All right. Here's my front. The back has, a. Uh, Where's my back? Here's my back. Um, the back has two darts, one at the shoulder and one at the waist. All right. And so, see, this is a good example. Like all my dart, all I didn't realize I did that. My darts are um, marked on the right side when I wanted them on the wrong side. It's probably because like, I am having trouble telling the right side of this fabric from the wrong side. It's really See, that's the wrong side, that's the right side. Um, it probably doesn't even look different to you. I'm just reading your comments. I just bought my first machine. Oh, congratulations on your first machine. That is pretty cool. Okay, so the way I'm going to fix this now is I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to push my pins like this, hope that there's no earthquake, and or, you know, some toddler running and screaming and distracting you and you're like oh no wait my pins are live <laughs> I'm actually only going to need one one extra because what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, put this one through just like that where that one was and pull this one out pin management <laughs> oops the wrong side see so it's right where it was and pull the other one out just like that I learned pin management when I had that roommate in college who kept stepping on my pins. She wasn't happy with me. All right. Okay. And then um, what I tell myself, if say I do have to stop and whatever, go pick the kid up from school, and uh, maybe I won't see this for another week, maybe I won't see it for another month, I learned my own little thing that makes sense to me is if I pin it like this, like obviously that's not the end of my dart, right? So how would I know when I came back to this, what's the end of my dart? So I always told myself, it's always where you poked it in, just ignore that. Always where I poked it in. That way um, I know exactly where my dart ended without having to get the paper out because, you know, it is, you know, you get 20 minutes to sew. You don't want to have to start over from the beginning figuring out where you were at, right? So these are really tiny little darts. This is so interesting that they put these on here. This also is a very, um, oops, I just backstitched that by accident. Um, this is a very uh, design school thing is to have a, uh, dart at the shoulder, um, not even a design school thing, but a very, it's an old school t uh, tailoring technique. It's actually not even in the shoulder, it's in the neck, which is weirder. I, I know where my, my pen is, don't worry. I can see the hole where it came out, and I'm going to do my little tying trick like that. Tie it. Ooh. You sure? Oh, you're making shirt number one. That is so cool because I just bought tunic, uh, tunic number, wait, is that what I bought? Tunic number one? I think I have that and I'm going to make, did you see Sonia's, um, little post in her gingham? Like she did like tunic number one and turned it into a dress or something like that. I've been wanting a gingham dress for like two years. <laughs> I used to have one like a long time ago. And when I, I just, I don't know, I wanted a black and white gingham dress. So, um, I, when I saw her, I was like, oh, I'm just going to copy her. That is just perfect. That's what I want. So now I'm just looking for gingham right now. So maybe, um, I'll be sewing that soon, Janice, and you can watch. Oh, that's cool, Kirby, that you made that. Did you make the, the did you make that with sleeves or without? Oh, shoot, I just pulled my pin out, didn't I? Eek, where's my pin? 
guys are distracting me. I will blame everything on you, I promise. Okay. I'm just going to use my other one to mark this one. Just my same little technique. <laughs> you will not get in over your head, Janice, I promise. You know what? This is what I tell people when they want to learn to sew or knit. I don't teach knitting or anything like that, but I've definitely met a lot of people that want to learn because of going to you know big shows like Stitches West and having a booth there. Um, I say pick the project that you really want to own because then you will figure it out. You will finish it. You might even have to make a couple to get it the way you want, but just pick the project you really want. Otherwise, you might be picking projects just that... Um, you know, that you're like, oh, I'm scared to do that other thing, but you may not ever wear it because you don't really want that. So pick the things that you really want or you've seen someone do in a way that you're like, oh, yeah, I like that. That's pretty simple. That's that's my advice. All right. <laughs> my mom just texted me. I was like, wait, why is my mom texting me? She's watching. Hi, Mom. <laughs> How often do you get to do that in life? <laughs> okay. Doing my waist starts. You guys are gonna have to forgive me too. I blush really easily. <laughs> it's like my it's like the worst thing ever. I can tell a funny story about my mom actually when I learned to sew. She'd probably say I'm remembering this all wrong, but I swear to God, when I learned how to sew, my mom forgot how. She was just like, oh. I mean, she didn't literally forget how, but she just had me do all the thing, all the sewing for her. And um, and then uh, I will admit that I did ruin all of her pillowcases because she had these really cool vintage pillowcases. I forgot to back tag here. That's why I'm going back and doing this. Um, she had these really cool. Maybe they weren't vintage. I don't know. They were just really cool individual pillowcases, and they were just in the cupboard. And you know, when I was in high school and tiny, I would take those pillowcases and make them into skirts by just cutting off the like bottom of the pillowcase and putting elastic in there and and then like the you know the part where you put the pillow in that was the hem it was like a 20 minute skirt for me it was really quick and easy and then she was like where did all my pillowcases go so <laughs> art gallery garden dreamer sprinkled peonies fresh well that's a mouthful shoot without sleeves think it might have been tunic number one I know I shortened mine, added mini bus starts to fit me. Cool. <laughs> Kirby's saying hi to you. Hit my mom. <laughs> All right, so here is my back bodice. I know I should be pressing. Here, I'll press. I have my little iron over here. I can actually um, drag the... Um, drag the cam camera so you can see a little bit more. Not that one. This. There you go. Uh, maybe you can't. I don't know. I have a little iron and ironing board over here. I'll just quickly iron those things. That way, um, I don't get in trouble for doing something else wrong. And we can iron our collar too. And our what is this? It's our facing, right? Yep. We'll iron that as well. So, um, how many of you have sergers or overlocks? Do you guys use those? Um, because I was thinking I could sew this without the serger and overlock if you would like to see how I'm going to handle not ha not using one. Um, I have one, obviously, it's right behind me, but I don't like using it on a lot of my homemade clothes because the thread I use on my serger for work, it's a little too heavy for what you're using on your garment and so I mean if you had a serger and you had the right thread great you know I used to have that I have some but it's not this color I mean this is a very specific color and if I wanted to get serger thread this color I'd have to buy probably four spools of that thread that's another twenty dollars just in thread to, sew, to overlock my seams 
Otherwise, I'd be doing cream. I do cream for just about everything I sew. I use cream thread. The only reason I'm using matching thread color <laughs> is that this thread came in my needle sharp box, you know, the box I keep blabbing about, and it matches perfectly for that. And I was like, oh, I have plenty of thread, so I'm going to use this. I'm kind of excited to have matching thread. All right, let me uh, iron my... And I'm not going to iron the whole thing, just, um, just the darts. Because there are wrinkles throughout, but... I don't really care about that. So let's see. Any of those? Oh, do it without the surgery? Okay. Yeah, so I do use the serger when making knit things. Uh, it's just, uh, I hate to admit it, it just works the best. Like, it's it's the most guaranteed result for success. And I'll tell you why. Mostly, it's the stretch. Because, like, on a seam, so that if I were to use my um, industrial machine to sew my serger, or sew, to sew a knit dress, there's a chance that when I'm wearing it, I could pop the seam um, because the seams, the lock stitch seam on a regular sewing machine, it, it just isn't made for the um, stretching. You know what I mean? And also sometimes they will pop before I've even gotten to finishing the garment. So I serge it together. Um, the other thing is that you know, I have a cover stitch component on this serger, which I will um, explain to you guys someday. But basically, if you look at any t-shirt that you own and it has the two, the parallel stitching on the hem, that's a cover stitch. And my machine does that, and I really like that. But you don't have to have that. You can just zigzag a hem. It's not that's not necessary for uh, you know sewing a knit. Um, it does help with the stretch, like it has a lot more give, but mostly your hems, unless it's like a, a shirt hem, like something like small, like right here, and you might be going like this with your shirt sleeve, most hems, like on a skirt or a dress, they don't really need to stretch, you know, because you're not really stretching out a hem, unless it's like a sleeve or something. I just have my bodice here. See how my dart looks. So, just in case you don't understand what darts are for, darts are giving me a bust. See that? And you don't want that point to end right at the apex of your bust. You want it to be about an inch below. I do see garments where it goes past the bust, and I have made a couple of things where that happens, and whew, that makes me pretty mad because it's really hard to fix that um, without really doing a lot of work on the pattern. Okay, here is my front. And now I'm going to do my shoulder seams. Let's see if my little seam allowance um, advice is going to pop up here. Okay, right sides together. Oh, but you know what? We're going to do French seams. All right, so French seams are a way to enclose the seam completely. And this makes it so that your seam isn't going to uh, fray or um, wear out as fast. And you don't have to use a serger or the zigzag. You could use a zigzag if you like. Um, but I'm not going to do that because it would take a while. It would take just as long. And it um, adds bulk. and you're going to say, see me say that a lot. I just don't like bulk in my sewing. It's probably because um, I just noticed that it has a bad effect. All right, so I want to do right sides together. I almost did it wrong. I always almost do it wrong. I don't do a lot of French seams, so bear with me. So I'm going to do wrong sides together, right? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, wrong sides together first. Wrong sides together. 
and I'm going to sew at a quarter inch seam allowance because these are half inch seams. I'm pretty sure these are half inch seams, so hopefully. <laughs> seam allowance is really important. I'm going to do a quarter inch seam. Okay. Wrong sides together. You know, you always want your armhole to armhole. That's how I know that I'm getting the proper bodice there. Some um, necklines are scooped enough that you're going to get the armhole confused with the neckline. Um, but typically, there will be notches in an armhole. See, so there's one notch always means front. Two notches always means back. Um, and then if there's three notches, it's just because they ran out of the one, the two, and then they need a third. Typically on something like this that has a little cummerbund around it, you'd have a third, a triple notch um, opportunity. So that's how you know front and back. One is always front, two is always back. Okay, I'm going to trim these a little bit more. Because you see these little bits of fray? That is your worst enemy when you do French seams. Those are always what poke out. I'm just going to warn you guys, I don't do a lot of sewing like this, so it's not my uh, number one thing. It's been a long time. I used to really be into garment sewing, you know, I had those like phases. Okay. So now I'm doing it right sides together, and here's my seam. So the best way to do this to ensure success is you're going to press the seam open like this. With your, sew with your iron, and then you're going to press it again like this. And the reason you do both is when you press the seam open and then you try and fold it along that, it's almost like it gives it a nice knife edge and it wants to do it. Okay, so now I'm going to do another, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 3 eighths. That's what it is. It's a quarter, then 3 eighths because it's a 5 eighths inch seam allowance. And then that's going to encase that seam. I can feel it in there. It's right here. Let's see how I did. All right, you see? So now that's my outer seam. This is my inner seam, fully encased, totally protected, and um, we won't have any issues with fraying, and I didn't have to use a serger. So yes, it's double the sewing. There's the drawback. You do use more thread. I know thread doesn't seem like a big issue to some people, but it can be if you're like low on it something to think about. Maybe I will do something different on the skirt side seams, but there's only two. There's no other side seams um, where I feel like French seams can be the hardest is when you're doing the waist seam because there's so, it, it's pretty bulky sometimes, especially if you had gathers. So we have our shoulder seams, and now we're going to put on our collar. So um, I actually probably will pin this. I'm trying to remember. I think, it, yeah, it goes right here. Like that. Yeah, I think like that. We're going to see. So what I usually do when I pin a collar is I start with the shoulder. So that seam and that seam, they got to line up. And I'm going to push this seam to the back. So then I'm going to pin right there. And I'm going to pin this one, push this shoulder seam to the back. And that seam, am I holding that in the camera? I hope so. Yeah, so I'm pinning. This to pushing the shoulder seam to the back and putting the collar right there on the seam. It kind of wants to nestle in there. Let's do it a little closer. I know I'm probably pulling things out of the camera. All right, so look at that. My uh, back collar lines up pretty darn good. So when um, another trick I do is when I have a bodice that's on the fold, if they don't have a notch at the um, center back 
of the neck or the collar while it's still on the fold like this I just go nip like this and then that way I have this little V and um, I don't know why a lot of pattern companies don't mark the center because it's just a nice way it's just another nice guide to have and sure success like I say so you see I have a little bit pulling away from the thing I'm gonna leave that and I'm gonna go by the collar or I may just be able to work it in like that I let the fabric tell me what it wants to do sometimes unless I'm like nope you're doing what I tell you because it's just a uh, better okay so here I am running into my little um, don't look at that mom <laughs> issue I'm just gonna trim this off and smooth it out like this it's gone the reason that you wouldn't want to sometimes do that is like, see, removing that little bit right there, if the, if I hadn't, that's where it would be, right? So now I'm moving the collar like this a little bit, which isn't how it was intended. That is why um, every little bit in a pattern counts. Seam allowance adds up, and um, I can tell you firsthand, I've seen so many people not do the correct seam allowance and they end up with something too big or too small when it's the most important thing for fit if you are pick if you picked a size based on the measurements that they wrote on the package you must abide by the seam allowances and I will tell you why I know it seems really obvious but say you have a garment with um, like this with just a side seam that's all on the bodice we're just gonna talk about the bodice and there's a side seam one here and one over here right so if you were to sew this at 3 8 of an inch instead of 5 8 of an inch you just added a half of an inch in circumference to the garment on one seam and a half inch on the other one that is a whole inch bigger and if you had a garment that had more seams like a princess seam um, bodice or um, just something else. There's lots of uh, op lots of opportunities. You are adding more and more and more circumference to your garment, and it can easily get two inches bigger in a heartbeat. Especially, say you're using quarter inch seams, and you just you just added three quarters of an inch to this one and three quarters of an inch to this one because if you did a quarter inch seam. If you did a quarter inch seam like this, not five eighths like this, you just added three eighths of an inch. Not to mention that the seam, this length here, isn't going to match. It might not match uh, when you go to sew it uh, because it's the seam line where the the stitching is supposed to go. But that's what you're lining up, right? What we we're talking about, like always lining up that juncture. I may lecture about this a little bit because it's really important to ensure success on your fit. And if you did this 5 eighths inch seam at a quarter inch seam allowance, you just added 3 eighths an inch here, 3 eighths inch here, 3 eighths inch, 3 eighths inch. That's an inch and a half in circumference like that. <laughs> so hopefully that illustrates why that's so important to follow your seam allowance. If you don't like the seam allowance of a um, garment, or say that this was uh, something I wanted to surge, I would still sew this at 5 eighths of an inch, but I'd trim a quarter of an inch off so that my seam is 3 eighths of an inch, but I just trimmed off the quarter inch, or I would trim it off before I sewed it so I didn't have to think about it. Um, and that's one way to get around it. Nothing wrong with that. You just need to accommodate all your seams. It's the same with a sleeve. If you sewed your sleeve to the armhole with a quarter inch seam, um, and it was meant to be 5 eighths, you're going to have a devil of a time trying to get the sleeve to fit in there really nicely because the measurement was made for the seam line, not away from it, not in front of it, nowhere else but that line. Where the line, where this line is, where you want that garment to finish, everything past that, the extra, has to be extra or you have to trim it off before you sew it. I hope that makes sense. I feel like it's really straightforward, but it is very subtle in a way that is so logical it gets missed. And um, I only really got passionate about that because I used to mentor high school students 
for this fashion program for five years and it was the most common mistake they would make and they wanted to rush ahead which was great I really loved that passion and that enthusiasm for what they were making but it would end up costing me time because I would have to take their garments apart or try and fit them and fitting them once they were completely finished a lot harder than just sewing it right to begin with and at least getting it close you know so I hope that wasn't too luxury for you guys but it's really really important it's the number one mistake people make okay so I'm going to put this all on so now what I'm gonna do since I already have pins under there I'm just gonna slip this pin out and put it back in just like that if you weren't watching I probably would have pinned all of this at one time but um, I wanted you to be able to see how I'm doing I don't want to hide any of my steps here so same thing I'm gonna line up my shoulders first and then pin it just like that okay so this has like a little notch this is a really interesting neckline so it has like a curve and then a V can you see that let's see it probably won't focus but see there's like a little V between the collar notches that little V there so that's what that is okay this is going along really quickly even though um, I'm probably making it take longer for you guys <laughs> it's not your dress huh <laughs> all right so I'm pretty sure the neckline is 3 8 of an inch uh, not 5 8 5 8 is just too big for a neckline when I draft patterns um, I always do quarter inch and that's what I used to do I used to be a designer and a pattern drafter in the garment industry um, primarily for um, I did children's when I first started out for a really big company and women's and then I went into the outdoor industry where I, I absolutely loved it and fell back in love with it because I was a little disenchanted when I left the garment industry it is a very wasteful industry it, at the time it was a very um, it wasn't the prettiest industry <laughs> so um, I kind of fled and then someone kind of sucked me back in which is a story for another time and I got into the outerwear come outerwear industry where I really loved it I felt like those were people that um, were really passionate about whatever they were using the garment for and that was kind of exciting okay so can you see like this is kind of messy here can you see how how much I have left hanging over there because when um, it doesn't line up perfectly in something like this it's okay and you want to go with the smallest piece right you don't want to go with go you don't go with meaning you don't want to start your seam allowance or your seam closest to the edge that is um, the shortest one because then that edge could potentially fall out of the seam and I can show you examples of that sometime because that's really frustrating it happens in our products sometimes um, you, you got you have a lot of layers you want to go with the one that your presser foot is closest to and measure your seam allowance from that point on something like this this isn't a fit thing this is really just a style line oh good oh I'm glad you want to sew thanks Vanessa <laughs> yes and all these videos will be on the web the, on the YouTube channel once I'm done it just automatically uploads and maybe eventually I won't do that just because maybe there we don't really need to have like two or three hour long videos sitting there for people to, <laughs> to watch but I feel like right now it's a good way for people to see like what this is about all right so I'm just I probably averted to quarter inch seam allowances here didn't I okay I'm gonna take a few of my pins out so I don't poke myself okay And then once I get this uh, on, I'm going to decide whether I, I might be understitching the, I think I'm understitching it. And I say one thing, not using the serger, um, this facing edge is kind of a pain to finish when you don't have a serger. I totally understand that. Um, and um, I have done it a few different ways. 
we'll get there in a second. All right, what am I doing next? I'm clipping, right? So I gotta clip that corner. This is an inverted one. You have to clip that. Um, and how about what I do is I will not clip one side and I'll show you the difference on why. Can you see? Sorry, sorry. So I clipped my corner there and I clipped right here. And I'm gonna clip this corner. This is a little more of a flatter uh, turn, but I still wanna clip it a little bit. And I'm going to notch into the collar. This is a little too too wide right here. Remember I was telling you my seam allowances. I, I, I'm going to trim a little bit of that. I don't like it. I would use a rotary knife on the table just because then I don't make the chance mistake of cutting my garment underneath. I'm using these big gigantic scissors which means my garment could get caught underneath. Okay. See Pellon's so sticky. I just don't like it. I usually use fabric. I don't really like having a synthetic next to my nice, yummy, all-natural material. <laughs> and um, I definitely don't use fusible interfacing. I'm definitely not going to glue anything. It totally works great. Don't get me wrong. And I don't care if people use it at all. It's just not something I like. And I think it's honestly because I worked for a woman who kind of tainted me on it. Um, and I'm trying to use it more often because it's a little more standard. And it is easy and it's really affordable and um, there's no grain line to it. You use less of your fabric if you tend to um, want to buy as little as possible. That Because sometimes facings take up a lot of your yardage in a weird amount and it's kind of wasteful. Okay, so this is the side that I did my little um, clipping. Okay, right? So... I haven't even uh, understitched or anything yet. Look at that, there's my little collar. Okay, so here's my other side. I didn't, this is painful for me to even turn this without um, having done that. <laughs> this fabric's pretty lightweight, so it's probably gonna be a bad example. But the, here's the biggest one right here. This won't lay flat, and do you see that pucker right there? It, it just, it can't release and let's look at what it's doing Can you see in there can you see that I'm gonna try and keep it from moving do you see this pucker can see look at this it's stretching as much as it can now watch you want to clip it and then it relaxed see that's what it wants to do it just this, um, like if you were to measure right here, this whole seam line, and then measure where this is sitting, this is a much longer measurement than that. So asking this edge that is shorter than that to be longer than that is a lot to ask of it. I hope that wasn't too confusing, but um, it, I tend to think inside out. That's why I was really great at pattern drafting, and I loved it so much. How many people do you know that tend to think inside out? <laughs> I have a very good spatial sense. I'm really good at parallel parking, too. <laughs> I darn well bet my daughter, who's learning to drive right now, is going to be a really good parallel parker, whether she's a natural at it or not. <laughs> okay, so we've trimmed around our edge. All right, let me see what your questions are here. You stop garment sewing once all the fabric stores close. I know, right? And you know, um, I'm so glad that there's been a resurgence in fabric stores and um, mostly they carry a better supply of quilting cottons than anything else, but I'll take it. You know, I'm just really glad and I'm really glad fabric companies are rising to the occasion and making more garment specific fabrics. So, Yeah, see, quilting cottons, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so um, some of the ways I get around, if I really like a quilting cotton and I really want to wear it as a garment, I cut it on the bias. And the bias is the diagonal grain line. It's um, just gives it more drape. Um, and I have a dress pattern that I really love to sew on the bias, and so we I'll do that soon because I just love that dress, and I wear it a lot. You'll see me wear it, and you won't even know it's on the bias, but it's it was quilting cotton. So, All right, so um, I have trimmed 
my whole neckline there. I'm going to understitch it and then I'm going to um, finish my facing edge. So I'm going to start with this up here. I'm probably going to wait to do the uh, center front and uh, because that's our button placket and I'm not quite sure what I want to do with that there. I'm going to wait till it's attached to the skirt to do it all in one. Yeah, and you know, you can make children's clothes out of quilting cottons. They work a lot better. Uh, and that's just because children do not do not have the shape that we do. They, they are more shaped like a cylinder than an hourglass or a pear or whatever shape you are. And they don't also require the drape that we do as well. It's just a much smaller amount of fabric, boardier works. It's more sturdy for them. Um, so it works. All right, so here we are at under stitching, right, everybody? So this is my right side of my garment, right side of my collar. Here's my face. This is a way easier way to see what I'm doing besides the collar. And all of this seam allowance is pressed towards this facing here. I love sewing kids' clothes. I loved being a um, pattern drafter for kids' clothing. It was really fast, too. You know, an interesting, um, <laughs> an interesting trivia fit note on kids' clothing is a child's head, it, when they're born, is almost the same size as what it will be when they're fully grown. Compared to the rest of their body, it grows the least amount. And they don't have a neck. I'm not insulting kids. It's just true. They just don't have a neck um, to speak of when you're fitting clothing to them. And so uh, when you make patterns for them, you have to have a much bigger hole <laughs> compared to their body as opposed to as like compared to an adult. And it has to have a usually in some instances, it has to have a shoulder opening. If you want a close neck, it has to have a shoulder opening so that you can get it over their head. That's why there, a lot of babies' uh, clothes have the snaps at the shoulder. It's because their heads are so gosh darn big. Trust me, women who have given birth can attest to that. So, All right, at least if they did it that way. Okay, I'm going to... All right, what do you guys think? What do you guys think, chat? Do you think I should just turn it under once? See, I'll tell you the pros and cons. Turning this under once to hem it, see, here's this great example of this. This is a shorter distance than where I want it to be when I fold it. So it's going to do this weird little, it's going to want to go away from the edge. So if I turn it a quarter inch and then I get to this curve, it's going to want to be really narrow right there. You see that? The pylon's fighting me too. So this is an instance where I would much rather um, serge the edge there or zigzag it. So, but I think I'm just going to wing it. See, the other thing is, you know, you could do a rolled hem or a really narrow. We could do a really, really narrow rolled hem. Oof, I'm not really good at those, but I'm willing to give it a shot. What do you guys think? Should I try it? Oh, you know what, though? I don't want to do the front yet. I don't want to do the front. I don't want to do this yet until I have my skirt. That's right. Because this is going to continue on on the skirt, remember? It's like a full front pocket. All right. We're going to wait. That's great. I am so glad to put off that painful step. <laughs> Usually, I try and meet that stuff head on because I don't want to um, <laughs> um, dread coming back to it. All right. We're going to do another French seam on our side seam. So we're going to do wrong sides together. Add a quarter inch. Okay. So I noticed that we've already been live for an hour and a half, which shocks me. Um, I don't know how long you guys really want to sit here on your Saturday doing this with me, but we could... I could put this aside until next Saturday just in case you guys can't tune in during the week like the Saturday viewers can't turn, tune in during the week and then do those little edge stitch under stitch top stitch demo if you want. Um, what do you what would you guys like to see? 
Oh, yeah. Finding fabrics that aren't made in um, China. Ooh. Finding anything that's not made in China. That's, that's really tough. A lot of the fabrics we get are printed out of the country, and I think they're made in another country as well, but I don't think China. Um, it's hard to find the information on some of them. I did find an all-American-made um, cotton cotton um, fabric company um, and I was like I signed up for it in a hot, a hot second I was so excited and then when I got the fabric um, swatches all they had was a lightweight solid cotton so I, I just couldn't use it for chicken boots like people aren't gonna go for it. it's too lightweight for us if it were solid and heavyweight, I can probably make that work, but it's lighter weight than quilting cotton. It was more like this and a little boardier, so it didn't have much drape. Um, but I really want to support them, and maybe someday I'll figure out a way to do that because um, I want that to stick around. I wish Spoonflower used an American sourced um, cotton. What's your question, Kirby? How often do you recommend having your machine serviced or in oiling your machine? Um, I would definitely look inside your manual because it says that. Um, and if you don't have the manual, Google it. My industrial machines, um, I they're self-oiling. I don't have to worry about that. Um, there's like a little, let's see, this right here. When I sew, it will, um, the oil usually bubbles up and, and shows me that there's oil in it. It doesn't really show me. I, this machine's new to me, so I'm not sure if it will. Um, and my machine sits in a pan of oil. Like underneath here, there's a pan the size of the machine, and there's like this much oil. It's just sitting in there, so I don't have to oil. A home sewing machine, though, there's going to be usually things that you should oil regularly. And if you sew a lot, um, I would you know, try it once a month, and if that's too often, like if you're just seeing extra oil sitting around and kind of building up, back off on it. If you, or, you know, I, I know you guys aren't oiling every month. I am right there with you. I haven't had my serger service since I bought it. <laughs> I did it myself eventually because I'm not waiting two weeks for them to do it. Um, but there are certain parts of your machine that you should not oil yourself usually, and you have to take them in to do it. They are also the parts you don't have to have oiled very often, maybe just once in a while when you're having a tune-up every couple of years. or uh, depends on how often you sew. It really does. Okay, did I do that right? Yeah. Okay, so we've got our um, armholes. So what do you guys think? Do you want me to continue on with this? My next thing would be sleeves. I would put the sleeves on right now. And I have a lot to say about sleeves. <laughs> I, want, I hope my collar stays down. If it doesn't stay down, I'll be mad. Like, really mad. Probably try this on soon. Let's see what it looks like so far. What do you guys think? I actually think this fabric choice is pretty good. I'm pretty excited about it. Right over a lot of people like this, yeah. What do you guys think? You gotta look good on me. <laughs> Make a drink of water. Make sure I'm not missing any of your comments. I could attach the pockets to the skirt. We could do that and then we could do the sleeves. Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to attach my skirt pocket. Bodice aside. My sleeves aside. Hey, it's kind of vintagey, huh? 
I mean, the silhouette definitely is, which uh, I just really love the day dress look. Okay, Kirby, this is for you. All right. I know that you probably won't build them. Oh, wait, we don't want these bottom pieces. We have, where's the skirt? Where's my skirt pattern piece? I pulled it out for you. Okay, so this is the front skirt. It actually has a, a big flare to it. That's how it gets the uh, volume. And can you see, this is the side seam. This is my new pocket opening. This is the waist. This is the center front. I'm going to weight this down with my scissors. Okay, so the original skirt pattern piece was this shape. So the whole thing was this shape. Does that make sense? Oh, you can't see the white paper, can you? Okay, the original shape was that, okay? Now, I kind of guessed and kind of uh, figured out how wide I wanted this opening to be. Remember, there's seam allowance here and here. I want a little more than my hand width. Um, and then, you know, this is also, there's seam allowance here too, so it's going to be a little bit open, more open that way too. So I trimmed that off, and I had to make two pocket pattern pieces. One that will be the background of the skirt because remember I still need this in order to sew it to the waistline. See like that. And then um, I made a pocket for each. So I made a pocket that looks like this which is this one. And that is also like the continue the continuation of my skirt seam waist seam right there because you can't lose that um, amount and this piece which is my top pocket so this is how my pocket will be this is under the whole skirt like that what do you think give me your questions <laughs> all right so now I'm gonna sew it together. And I keep all my pattern pieces together. Move my back skirt out of the way. And um, I'm going to make sure I have a right and a left. Okay. That. Like this. my right that's my left so my hands gonna go right here into this pocket and hopefully my you know I kind of guess like I said on the measurements okay so this is my right see sometimes you just line it all up so that way you don't have to think about it later and you'll notice like this is wrong side up because the right sides are together right there Move that over there. And I'm going to sew this right sides together. This is the pocket opening first. I got to pick the seam allowance on this, so I picked a quarter inch. And um, I'm being really careful not to pull on this because when I made that diagonal line for the pocket opening, that is the bias of the fabric. It's really easy to get it stretched out. So, yeah, I am constructing the pocket first, and then I will sew it to the skirt, kind of. Like, I'm going to attach the facing to this first, like this. And then I'm going to understitch it. We're learning a lot about understitching. You could top stitch it so that the stitching showed, but I, I want this to be a little bit more invisible that, than that. Oh, look at that. 
it's like the print matched up. No need to um, backstitch that. Okay, so now I'm going to sew my pocket together around the perimeter. And you know what? I'm going to do a French seam. So I'm going to do wrong sides together. So yeah, typically I probably would have, um, if I were just sewing this on my own, I would have done this, like I would have just gotten the skirt ready, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually, I'm, I'm kind of doing it in the same order I normally would. You always do, I guess what you could call the accessories of your, of your garment first. Like if there was a shirt pocket, you would sew that onto the shirt first. Um, you put the collar on first. You do all your darts first. You do all that stuff first, and then you start to assemble the garment together. So that way, um, you don't have to attach the pocket once the garment is already put together. These scissors are just terrible. They really need to be. Uh... Here, no, 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 I can't do that. Okay. Um, you don't have to do things in that order in, in some cases, but it's just, like I say, it's ensures success that you don't accidentally catch the pocket onto the back of the shirt. If you already had your shirt constructed and you had to put the pocket on there, that just makes it harder. And why make it so hard for yourself? You know, like, why not make it a little easier? All right, so I'm, I'm still going around the pocket bag. This is called the pocket bag. I was thinking of it as the bolso. <laughs> just because that's the Spanish word, and um, I worked in a lot of factories where we had a lot of Spanish-speaking people, and we had our patterns marked for both. Plus, you see it in um, home sew patterns, too, and I just like that word. <laughs> it just sounded better than pocket bag. I don't know why. Okay. This would be easier if I had ironed it. If I pull a little bit, then it, it actually kind of makes it behave. Pocket bags are a really great place to cut your teeth on French seams, to be honest, because no one's going to see if you didn't get that seam allowance quite right, because only your hand is ever going to see the inside of your pocket, right? And your change and your, your keys and all that. No one's uh, going to turn out your pockets and see how well you did on your, um, you know, French seams. I mean, look at that. I didn't even really... Get it right on the edge. Okay. So now we have our pocket. I'm making it look really fiddly. Here we go. This is on the way. So this is what's great is that this pocket, Right, Kirby? That's what you wanted, right? So, there's a little bit that goes in the side seam right here. And then the little bit that goes in the waist, and so my pocket will always be forward. Makes you look so professional when you do that, too. So, what I do to make this easier on myself is now I'm going to actually tack this down right here just a little bit in the seam allowance and then I'm going to tack it at the waist as well there's a, a notch there that's for sewing it to the bodice okay there we go now now that'll it'll, it'll kind of behave a little better just like that <laughs> it's a little puckery I'm trying to figure out why that is is it because I didn't iron it <clears throat> I'm actually going to take this out right here and solve that right now that's another reason why you don't backstitch when you baste too you can just pull out the thread just like that 
See, and that's why <clears throat> I wanted my students to follow their seam allowances because I provided the seam ripping for free. It was my free service I provided for them. Okay, see, another way to make sure this is flat is I'm going to flatten out the whole pocket. It's probably because the seam allowance I used on the French seam wasn't perfect, uh, perfectly a half inch or five eighths. And um, now I'm a little off right here, and so that's why it was pulling. You see, that looks way better. Yeah, you think you can do that, Kirby? See, and if you wanted the curve, you would just make this pocket curved. And if you sew this opening as a curve, remember, you got to clip around that curve before you turn it to the other side. Otherwise, uh, you'll get that stretching, puckering thing. Um, you know, the seam will be angry with you, basically. Feels pretty good, though. So now my front skirt is ready to go. And... Um, I won't have to worry about sewing the pockets on it. It's just ready when I am ready. Okay. Same thing. So the pocket opening. If you ever want me to repeat something, you guys, you just let me know. I can do it. And see, this is starting to stretch out because it's on the bias. You got to be really careful. I'm not going to backstitch right now because I don't want to stretch it out a little more. I'm kind of pushing it to kind of keep it. Keep the grain line intact. When I understitch it, that's going to reinforce it so I didn't need to do the back stitch. Okay. All right. And after I sew this pocket, I'm going to do my little stitch demo and then um, I can let you guys go. All right, so now wrong sides together, right? Every time I have to remember how to do this. <laughs> like I said, I don't do a lot of French scenes. But um, it's good practice because that Charlie Car Charlie Kaftan that I'll be sewing is French seams, and it's rayon. I'm actually a little nervous about that fabric on this machine. Um, I haven't sewn rayon on an industrial machine in a while, and I, have, I worry that it's going to get sucked into the feed dogs. Feed dogs are the under portion of your machine. The feed dogs are the things that move like this to kind of grab your fabric and keep it going through the machine. I did that wrong size together, right, guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay. Ooh, it's hard to tell the difference between this right side and the wrong side. Actually, I think I missed that a little bit. Now I'm going to do my last front seam. Oh, see, I missed that. See, perfect. See, I knew it felt off right there. Great. Let's look at the other side. I feel like sewing in a lot of ways is like math. You should always check your work. Because going back and trying to fix it later is so much harder than if you caught the mistake right at the beginning. You know? It's kind of like the measure twice cut once thing or in um, my shop policy, measure four times, measure it again, and then cut it again. <laughs> then cut it because, you know, sometimes you kind of make that measurement up by accident. Or you count them wrong. Whatever it is. So um, I've now have a stream schedule so Tuesdays Thursdays and Saturdays I'm gonna start streaming I know it'll be kind of light at first like with people coming and getting used to it and I know a lot of people are unfamiliar with streaming I'm really into streams I watch them for something else that I like to do and I have just found it such a really great community because People can comment in the stream and ask a question, and someone in the chat or the person streaming can answer it right then, and you get your answer, and you can say, hey, I'm having this problem, and, and people have been there. They have had that exact same problem, and I really like that kind of community. I used to get nervous being in a stream, and then I realized, like, no one can see me. No one knows who I am. This is a completely anonymous space, depending on my username, right? And um, I really like that because I get, I don't, I, contrary to probably how it looks, I don't like going out into the world very much. I don't like doing things like that either. It make, they make me kind of nervous. And I don't know why, but I feel really comfortable in, in the streaming thing because it is a little bit more 
just low key, I guess is how to put it. All right, I'm gonna tack my side seams down. And um, I really would like to do this with you guys. I'm really into it, so I'm really nervous too. Okay. Remember, I drafted this pattern myself really quickly last night on top of someone else's pattern, and, and I was trying to figure it out. So there's my pocket. Ooh, nice and roomy. Okay. So let's put our skirts away. They are ready for next time. And would you guys like me to finish this um, next Saturday? Like, is this a Saturday <laughs> group or something? Or do you even care? Let's see. I will put these over here. I'm looking forward to showing you how to sew sleeves in, especially when it's not a gathered sleeve. Because I think um, a lot of people struggle to do that. Oh, I still have my muslin I want to sew as well. So. I made a bunch of these. We don't have to go through all of them. I just made them to have. Here is a couple fronts. I'll just do it like that. I'm going to sew these. Okay, so we have our facing. Here's a good example of the seam allowance thing I was talking about. Okay. Can you see that? All right, I want this to line up at the half inch mark. Can you see how this is hanging off right here? <laughs> I don't appear nervous. Well, you know, I really love doing this. So it's it's in my comfort zone. Like this, I know this, this is great. And I make mistakes, I don't care that I make mistakes. Uh, everybody makes mistakes the world over doing things like this constantly and if they're hiding that then just know that they are still um, and I don't mind showing my mistakes and that's not what makes me nervous to do in front of someone making a mistake I think it's more like people being interested in actually wanting to do this and hanging out together that that makes me nervous I would really like this to work out so because I just like it okay so here's my little seam allowance tip I'm going to use um, the thread here just because I know it's a, it'll show up. Okay, so I sewed my seam. Oh, it didn't back tack all the way. Um, at the half inch mark. And this is supposed to hang off like that because when I do this, it lines up. See? It lines up with the neck. And um, that is why you see that tag, that kind of extra a bit, uh, hanging off of a seam allowance. And sometimes it's quite drastic. You'll see a really long, sharp angle, and that's because you still need this to get caught in the neckline. If it had been cut away, it, it wouldn't get caught. It would be like out here, and then it could end up flapping around and not staying where you put it. You want it to be into the neckline. And this is a, this is a pattern I threw together. It's not done yet, so it's not even like refined for that kind of um, production sewing yet, or not production, I should say, but um, like for me. I'm making myself a, I, I've always had my own block, and a block by block I mean a garment that fits me. And so I can manipulate that pattern into whatever design I want and then make whatever I want. And um, I know everybody can't do that, but I can, so I do. And I really enjoy it, and I just try and help others make you know, their own pattern alterations on the patterns that they've got at hand. Because um, you can turn anything into a basic block if you really like that garment and you want to make more of it or you want to, if, if it fits really well and you want to just change it into a few things, a lot of garments can work for that. So um, that's what this is for me. It is my basic block. Um, also sometimes called a sloper in the garment industry. It just depends on, I think, an East Coast, West Coast thing or maybe the year that they came out, you know, so... This is, uh, these little trials are based on my block, which is not finalized yet. 
So I'm going to make a few of these little, like, fake yoke thing, little fake, they're like little dickies, aren't they? Ooh, that was a long back tag, sorry. Still getting used to my machine. Okay. So, let's do something besides understitch, shall we? Shall we? <laughs> I'm going to put this facing on. Oh, it's probably going to stick out because uh, one of them had a seam allowance for a button placket. So the way I can get around that is I will line it up with the neck of the seam lines here. And I'm going to open up my seam since we're not surging or anything. And I really want um, there to be less bulk when I go to top stitch this so we can I can show you the difference. So it's pretty cool, like people showed, they, they watched my little intro video and because of that I got so many views on it, it unlocked almost all of the streaming capabilities that YouTube offers to me, which is really great. Um, my next milestone is so far off though, it's my last thing to unlock. And it's such a bummer, I just learned today that I have to get 100,000 subscribers. <laughs> A hundred thousand people need to sign up to watch my stream. They don't have to tune in. They need to sign up for it. Um, I think my Chicken Boots newsletter list is like 7,400, and that's after nine years of working really hard on giving, getting, getting it going. So I don't know if I'll ever unlock that other feature, but I'd say tell your friends, but I doubt you each know 25,000 people. <laughs> If you do, <laughs> and they want to sign up for a sewing stream, right? Okay. I'm going to trim this off. This is unnecessary. I forgot to do it on the pattern. All right, so what are we going to do next? We're going to clip it, right? Okay, we're going to clip, clip. If, you're sh if your scissors are really sharp, you can just do this, too. These are just not anymore. I thought these would stay sharper a lot longer than they have. I have uh, probably 10 little pairs of scissors around my office. These are the nicest pair I use for sewing. The others I use for cutting twine, ribbon, bias, all kinds of things. They're just everywhere around the office. All right, so we're going to top stitch. The, we're we're going to edge stitch this, actually. We're going to edge stitch this. Edge stitch and top stitch are very, very similar. The difference being top stitching is... Um, can be more decorative and it's a little more of an intentional placing of it. Um, think about like, I know Kirby, it's so many things. I would unlock uh, the ability to have um, memberships on my channel, which would allow people to, I could have my own emoji and um, they would have a badge. They could have like, they could subscribe to me but like via a membership way that's that's what the hundred thousand mark is and it just changed it was a thousand and I was like I can do it I know I can do a thousand someday I'm gonna get to a thousand hundred thousand I'm feeling a little down about that so we'll see all right so top stitch when you have a jean pocket on the back of your pants and there are those two rows of stitching holding it on there that is top stitching but so it's the thing, they're both really similar and they can be used interchangeably. The two, because there's two parallel rolls, that's technically at the factory would be called double needle top stitch. Um, one though, of course, next to the edge is the edge stitch and the one to the you know right of it is the decorative second parallel line would be a top stitch, but together they're a double needle top stitch. So when a pattern says top stitch this, um, you're going to do it what you want it to be and how you want it to look. Edge stitch, you want it to be close to the edge. And typically, I put it less than an eighth of an inch away, but you can put it even closer. And um, you could also call this a top stitch. So it just depends on what the pattern company uses as their lingo. So I'm pulling the facing under here, I'm pulling it this way, and making sure that only the outer is what's showing as I do this. 
it would be um, even easier if I ironed it. I promise I will iron more often for you guys, but um, I don't, you know, we're going for education, right? So, so I sometimes get sewing texts from my friends, and um, it's hard to answer them via texting, and this is one I got maybe from Kirby or from my, from my friend Amanda. I can't remember what the difference between understitch top stitch and edge stitches and they understitch is a very functional thing we did a lot of that today it's very obvious what it's used for uh, top stitching a little more decorated decorative so this would be my quickly done top stitch or edge stitch um, if this were a beefier garment with a lot more layers I would probably stay this close, like this closest part or a little bit more closer to the edge and, and definitely would be an edge stitch. So, um, and if we were to add, you know, a parallel line. So when they do that in the factory, the parallel line, that is a twin needle machine. And you can actually buy a twin needle at the fabric store. I've used them. They're amazing. <laughs> they really fake the double needle look perfectly. Like me doing it like this may look okay but when you see a twin needle do it it's definitely different you use one bobbin you can use pretty much any home sewing machine the only um, thing that you must have is a hole down here under your machine to your bobbin that's wide enough to accommodate both needles because mine um, you can't see it is a single hole let me see I don't know. See, can you see that? That's a little hole that the needle goes to. That's a specifically my industrial machine, how it's set up. So it it uh, couldn't use one of those twin needles. I would need an entirely different throat plate. That's what this is right here. So home machines, though, they can do that. So, you know, see, it's okay. You would never do this on a neckline, obviously. We're just doing it as a um, uh, demonstration. Um, I can also show you what stitch in the ditch is. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of that. Um, let's see. I could let me just do one other facing, and we'll just do it on a new one so you can kind of see. This is my shoulder. Okay. Sure, if I got the right. Yep, I did. Okay, good. Make sure I have the <laughs> the left and the left, or the right and the right. So you never want to sew on your machine without um, fabric between the needle and the bobbin. The only exception is on a serger. I'll tell you why, and it's because. On your regular machine, it's a lock stitch. You have a bobbin and you have an upper thread. And that, what's happening is that the threads are doing this, right? And they're making a lock. So one's coming up and there's all this little intricate little passing through. That happens, they meet and they become friends. And then you create this lock stitch. And that's why when you adjust your tension, you can pull up the bobbin threads to show on the top or pull down the... Um, upper thread to show on the bod bobbin and you want that happy medium where you don't see either and um, when you use a serger that is only upper thread there's no bobbin thread uh, so it's a chain stitch and that means you can sew without fabric in under the needle and um, it's safe to do that so but if you sew without thread in your, or I mean, I'm sorry, I keep saying thread. If you sew without fabric in your machine, you will break it pretty badly. So don't do that. Okay, I'm going to just throw this on. And I'm going to do a different, you know what, I think I actually flopped the, um, that's the shoulder. Oops. We're just going to make this work for the stitch in the ditch. Because I'm sure some of you have heard that term, stitch in the ditch. I'm just going to do a little bit. And so I made 
the shoulder seam on here go this way and then the shoulder seam on here go that way to create less bulk. So if these were overlocked, you could do that to create less bulk that way. All right. Yeah, if you're, exactly, if your home machine has the um, zigzag capability, then yeah, you most likely can use the twin needle. And the twin needle, I think, comes in two different parallel widths. Um, I would opt for the quarter inch. It's more what you're accustomed to seeing, and you'll probably visually be more attracted to that once you see it sewn. Um, yeah, so you could totally do that, and it's so much fun. I, I may have one. Let me see. I have one here. You know what? Actually, it's on my home. Um, my home machine's cabinet is actually at my house. I have a cabinet where the machine goes down into it and comes up, and then all the notions for it are in there. I brought it to work to do something, and then um, I have never brought it back, and it's actually been kind of handy here since I'm doing more garment sewing. So, yeah, Kirby, it's really fun. You can you can't use it in place of cover stitch though, so don't be fooled by that because your machine is still a lock stitch. You can't you can replace the look of cover stitch but you can't use that on knits because they don't make the twin needle as a ballpoint, I'm pretty sure. And um, you need ballpoints for knits because a ballpoint needle, when it's passing into the fabric, is pushing the fiber, hopefully pushing the fibers aside, not piercing the fibers. That's why sometimes when you see your t-shirt hem have little holes coming near the stitching lines or holes in general, it's um, because the fibers got pierced when it was sewn and it created a run just like you get in your, your nylons um, or your, your stockings. That is the same type of thing because stockings are knitted and knit fabric, most knit fabrics, not all stretches, but most knit fabrics are knit together. It's just microscopic thread, right? <laughs> not microscopic literally, but it's really small. And so those are continuous strands of fiber creating the fabric and if you pierce or clip one of those then you're essentially causing a run and I bet some of you are knitters because if you know me you came to me probably from chicken boots and your knitter you know what happens when you clip one yarn strand in your sweater right it starts to run and you get a hole it's the same principle in knit fabric or a jersey or a um, you know any of those interlock anything like that you are going to pierce the fiber if you don't use a ballpoint needle and um, your machine will be happier with a ballpoint needle when you sew knit. So I know it's so many details. Um, don't get overwhelmed by that. Just stick to one thing at a time until you get used to it. All right, stitch in the ditch. Why do we need stitch in the ditch? Have you guys all heard about that? So it's really great on a facing. Say you didn't, you can't understitch it for some reason. Who knows why? Say you understitched it and your facing is still flipping to the outside because of whatever the fabric is finicky um, or maybe the neckline shape is finicky. You can do something called stitch in the ditch. And what you do, make sure, in fact, we're going to make sure that this is all flat because we didn't even sew it all the way around the neckline. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit finicky, right? So I'm going to make sure all of that's flat there. And then I'm going to pull apart the seam like this. I'm going to stretch it. You see my stitches there? And I'm going to stitch in that ditch. And watch. Even though I'm using this really dark thread, you're probably not going to see it as bad as you think. Ooh, my needle's kind of big for this. Okay, see? I stitched right... Is that in the ditch? I'm going to get rid of this right here because when I backstitched, I don't know why, backstitching is never as straight as going forward. <laughs> Maybe it's like driving a car. So if I had used cream thread, this would most likely not even show. Um, I'm going to prove that to you guys. <laughs> I'm going to switch my thread really quick to cream.
I just tie my thread like that, and then I pull it through. That's how I'm able to do it so quickly. That's how I do my serger as well. I know most people know that trick. You can't pull it through the needle hole, but you can um, pull it through the rest of the way. Okay, so let's pull this out. But yeah, and so when you do stitch in the ditch, it's most likely you're not going to get in the ditch of the facing um, right on top of the other. Maybe you'll get lucky and that'll happen. Um, most likely it won't. That's okay. No one's going to see that. Uh, if you don't want to stitch, like say it's a very uh, fine fabric, like just a really light weight, maybe it's a chiffon, maybe it's a silk, maybe it's just something you're like, oh, that's just too much stitching. You don't have to stitch for as long as I do. I used to just do a tiny bit right at the edge of the facing. Okay, so I'm going to switch my bobbin as well. And then I always sew a little bit when I change my bobbin. Um, and you may not have to on your home machine, I, I, it, but um, industrials are a little messier underneath, and that helps cut down on the mess. Okay. So cut me a little slack. Remember, my, my seam there is in the dark green thread, but I'll do just out here a little bit. I'm going to pull it really far. And then I even back tacked, so I added a lot of extra stitching. But see, if you're wearing that, let's get rid of this one too. This is much less noticeable than if your facing is flipping to the outside. I imagine you guys would probably agree. I can do, the, and so that's all it looks like on the inside is just this little tiny hit of back tack. So that is, a, you can do it by hand as well if you um, don't want to do it with your machine. I'm using a size 14 needle, so it's a little heavy for that, especially if you were doing something that was lighter weight or fancy or something like that. So, um, all right. Well... I think I'm going to sign off, guys. I don't want to, but I don't want to wear you guys out. <laughs> no one take up your whole Saturday and be like, I can't just keep going and watching streams all day Saturday. But I really want you to get out there and sew. And um, I really want to hear from you on um, what you would like to see. I have an email address, so so live at gmail.com. And if you're not on the newsletter list, sign up. Um, you can do so on the chickenbootsusa.com website. And there's a tab that says So So Stream. You can get find the newsletter link there, and that will keep you updated on what my schedule is. Tuesday, I think I'm going to focus on some production style sewing. So if you're interested in efficiency and how to do multiples in a row, um, or you just want to see me sew ch chicken boots things, I don't care if it competitors want to ask questions or other people who are trying to get a factory off the ground. Ask me questions. I'm totally collaborative that way. I don't have any problems with that at all. We're all in it together is the way I feel about it. And I like being able to share knowledge because I want people to share their knowledge with me sometimes as well. Um, Thursday, I'm going to start my Charlie Kafton um, in my Needle Sharp subscription box. And then Saturday, I will continue on this dress. Now I really want to finish this dress. <laughs> I'm so close. So I'm going to... Um, work on that next Saturday and hopefully we'll finish it up. Maybe not the buttons and buttonholes, but everything else. And um, my Charlie Kaftan should be really fun. I've never made one of those before and it's really cool. So check me out on Instagram. It's so, so live and um, sign up for the newsletter. And if you hit the little bell on your YouTube, if you're not using your phone, I think on your laptop or your computer, there's a little bell, like a little bell. You click that, it will notify you every time I'm live. And if you're on your phone, you may have had to have hit that right when you subscribed to me. And then it said, do you want to be notified? And you have to have notifications on. Um, but all the streams will be uploaded to the website afterward. This one's going to pretty much stink at the beginning since I heard, didn't realize I didn't have my microphone on yet, um, unfortunately. But I'll put a little note about that. 
Um, someone's working on a logo for me, so um, hopefully all that branding will happen by October and it'll look all polished and nice. So the stream grid answer. All right, wait, what? What you have a few questions here? Okay. Thanks, Barb. <laughs> oh, good, Janice. Ha happy sewing. Um, Tuesday and Thursdays they will be at. Um, 10 a.m. to noon, and Saturday is 11 a.m., and that's all Pacific. I'm in California, so if that works for you guys. And if those stream times are just not working, tell me that. Like, just please tell me what you want to see in here. So, all right, guys, happy sewing. Um, have a really great weekend. Hopefully I'll see some of you on Tuesday for some production-style chicken boots because I really do got to get fall finished. I'm not the only one sewing it, but I got to get a lot more fall finished and um, – photographed to be able to launch so thanks for stopping by and um, have a great weekend and happy sewing so take care bye